Um, so not a problem. If you have to disappear, no problem. Great talking to you. Hopefully we'll chat a bit later. So, right, let me get into my character. Hi, let me just look at the camera up there. <laughs> Hi, I'm Inky. I'm an investigative journalist living in this lovely little small town of Deal and Dover. The town I grew up in is very strange. Lots of highwaymen, lots of smuggling, lots of very strange things. And some of these stories are partly from things that have come to me through my digging and some cases, personal experiences. So hopefully they'll chill. I have my Blair Witch effect may come in later and I'm raring to go with my absinthe. So this first story concerns Toby. Toby was nervous. Well, a first date always made him nervous. Or was it the fact that it was a bit of a setup by some friends he, he sort of sort of known for what about like centuries even? Or even is it because he was standing alone in a very cold, pitch dark park in the rain with a little bit of a gale blowing, waiting for his date? But anyway, he was nervous. There was nobody around. The odd sudden disturbance in bushes sort of uh, left him a bit more anxious than he really felt he should be. But he waited, he waited for her. He thought perhaps it should actually be a better idea to have met in the restaurant over the road, but no, Elizabeth or Beth as she preferred to be called, decided they should meet in the park first. And so he went with that. Some clicking of heels caught his attention. And in the pools of light of the street lamps through the park, he spotted a lone figure approaching, wrapped up tight against this awful weather. Definitely a woman. He could see the hills and he could see the, hear them clicking. And she approached. Well, he was the only other person in there. So I assumed that's who she was heading for. It was dark. There was no clouds but the street lamps cast some glow. And when he saw her face, he was amazed, absolutely beautiful. Considering the weather and all, her makeup was immaculate and her face turned into a nice grin as they both hugged. The scent was overpowering, beautiful fragrance of jasmine. Pleasantries were exchanged. They linked arms and headed over to the restaurant over the road. The waiter met them inside and took their coats. He got his full view of Beth at that point and he was embarrassed quite quickly when he let out a bit of a whistle and a gasp. He tried to cover his word, his sort of response with some, something hilarious, just to cover his growing blush. You look almost good enough to eat, he, he blurted out. Then that made him even redder. He thought, oh my, this is not going well to start with, is it? But no, she smiled and touched his arm and whispered in his ear, Good enough to eat later though. He couldn't respond to that. She grabbed his arm and followed the waiter who was rushing to get them seated. The meal was fantastic. The whole evening, in fact, they talked, they ate, they drank, they talked some more all night until they were the last pair in the restaurant. 
The company was superb. The food was superb. And it's his favorite restaurant. So they got his steak as rare as he liked it. Perfect. But then they had to part. Call him old fashioned. He wasn't going to go back to her flat to start with. He wanted to take it slow. So they got taxes and went their separate ways. They continued to having a few more dates here and there, mostly in the evenings because, you know, they both worked. One night they had, they were snogging at the back of a cinema row. He felt very much like a teenager again. But things were moving on quite well, and he was happy. Apart from one thing, although she dressed absolutely immaculately every time, she always wore a little scarf, and, you know, it was stylish. But no matter what it was, it was there. And, okay, this is a very minor thing to be moaning about when there's such a beautiful woman that's willing to spend time with him he admits that it it got away in the way a few times when they were having their bit of a snog in the in the cinema for example and and it was starting to get a little bit of wearing on him but no he put that to one side they were getting on so well and beth was brilliant they were, they just clicked in every way. Well, days will go and pass quite quickly. And tonight was an interesting date. Beth suggested he come round and she cook. Now he, this was unusual. Now, did that, was that code for something? He was thinking it was. He was even more nervous than the first time now. If it was going to be the night. Well, you need to be good. He needs, needs to think this over and stay calm. Many of these things were running through his head in various ways as he stood upon her porch on her uh, front door. The moon was starting to come out on the other, which was a nice break, so at least he wasn't soaking wet tonight. He tapped on the door of her apartment and it opened, again, immaculately dressed. It's as if they were going out for the evening, but they were staying in, right? I was certain that was so. You know, it was a lovely little blue dress. And again, this neck thing, which, okay, it was lovely, but it was starting to, um, it, it may get in the way later if things were gonna go the way you thought they would. It gets very annoying, but he pushed that aside again because there are other things to worry about. They had a meal. She was cooking after all. It wasn't code. Well, but not at least this stage. And he had to congratulate her on her planning because the meal was very light. Okay, perhaps he hadn't misread the situation. A light meal, very good, very clever. Chat again was lovely. It was very jovial. And after the meal, she suggested, why don't we sit on the sofa and watch a scary film? Scary film? Um, a scary film. Ah, uh, then he twigged and he was equally in amazed at her planning. Scary film means when it gets scary, they can cuddle up. Fantastic planning. Beth is a master at this. So they sit down to watch the film. And yes, at the scary parts, they hung on to one another. 
but his well, blood was beginning to boil here. This was, was, was she waiting? Was she waiting for him to make a move? So he made a move and began to kiss along her shoulder, up to her neck. And then his passion went. A mouthful of scarf again. He wasn't going to let this get in the way. So he pulled the scarf and went in for another kiss again. But there was air that met his mouth. He moved around. Where's she gone? He pulled back and opened his eyes to notice there was no head on her shoulders. Down here, her voice from her lap, looking down. He saw her face, her head, looking back up at him. Thank you, Toby. Could you re please reattach my head? That scarf was actually holding me my head on until I get some new bolts. Okay. Momentary froze there. But he couldn't think of any other reason not to, so he lifted her head up and put it back on and held it there while she fumbled with the scarf and secured her head back on her shoulders. Now, Toby at that point was not start was starting to feel a little bit weird. Was it the food? Was it this sudden shock? No, no, I think it was something else. And he started to shiver quite badly. Well, Beth, says Toby, if you have a slight secret there you want to share, I think I should share my own secret. And he started to shake quite badly, leaning back onto the sofa, his face starting to run with sweat. Beth was quite disturbed or and concerned. Are you OK there, Toby? And then his face started to change. His fingers started to increase claws and his face elongated and fur began to grow quickly on his body. Oh, wow, says Beth. A werewolf? Wow. This monster dating website is fantastic. What a great match. I love a man who's wild. Come on, and she grabs his hand and drags him to the bedroom. Thank you. Uh, I hope that was entertaining enough. <laughs> uh, I do enjoy that one. Yeah, I did. I thought it was going to be a vampire story or something. Yes. Until yes. the head came off. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you know, it's all the misdirection on this one. I get quite a lot of people with this one because they're thinking, oh, stay yes. quite early on bit of blood there one may be a vampire yeah There's something going on with this head thing that's likely to happen exactly. <laughs> but then spin it round yeah that's nice thank you yeah right. are you really drinking actual absinthe i am yes it's, really? it's it's can i see it properly then okay great and that's fruit inside is it no no or these are ice cubes sugar Oh, that's ice. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, plastic things with. This ice. is the first time I've seen actual labs. Yeah, it's it's not illegal in the UK. Um, and this there's a new um a London distillery that started um creating absinthe um, about two years ago, and this is their oh. white absinthe. I need okay. to get the green next. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it is it's really quite strong. <laughs> but it's it's medicinal for my throat. <laughs> right. Of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, leave it that where that, uh, shall we? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> right. The next one is actually based on a bit of history. Now, in this town of Dover, in 1814, I think probably, I'm not sure if it may have been July, sometime in July, or even August, in 1814, two people eloped. They were very famous, or would be. One in particular was very famous at the time, Percy Shelley. In his late twenties or early thirties, was eloping with his new bride to be, Mary, who was only sixteen at the time. They had left hurriedly left London on this one summer's morning, and were heading to Dover to catch a ship across to France where they were then going to get married and live. They were trying to get as far away as quickly as possible because people didn't quite agree to this wedding. Now, Mary Shelley eventually went on to write the greatest and first of modern horror, Frankenstein. And obviously Percy Shelley was uh, a phenomenal poet. And also he claimed ownership of Frankenstein until quite a while after her death, when it was discovered that she was the writer. So no one's really entirely certain how she came up with a story for Frankenstein. But in my digging, I have encountered a small fragmented diary entry that documents the journey that Mary and, Sh and Percy took across the channel. And for me, it gives a possible avenue and reason for her origin story of Frankenstein. If you see, the journey across the, on, the, on the ship, normally it would only take three hours. But on that day, it turned into a seven to eight hour nightmare journey. For a storm suddenly appeared out of nowhere, just over halfway across the channel. They couldn't turn back. They had to keep going. Percy was summoned to be on deck as all abled men were required to help control the ship to get it across safely. Mary stayed below. A fellow, uh, two passengers equally had to endure the same. And the woman called who, who shared, um, Mary refers to as Margaret, joined her in Mary's cabin while both their men, travellers, um, companions, helped with the, the ship. Mary was deeply upset over this journey. She feared for her life. She was extremely seasick, but she may have been knowingly pregnant at the time. And a company with Margaret, they consoled one another that they would survive this. In their conversation, Mary wrote this diary entry because Margaret had an interesting story to tell. Margaret was also fleeing the UK although she hadn't traveled that far. She was actually originally from Dover. And all she would say of her reasons at that early on point until the story revolved was that she was traveling with her cousin who was going to help her settle in a new country 
she had something to run and hide from. So this is the story that is related to she um, Mary by Margaret. Margaret was the wife of a successful surgeon and GP in Dover. They lived in St. James's area at the bottom of the hill from the, the, the castle, that's just up there for me. And they had a, a lovely, prosperous life. Her husband, Charles, he was a surgeon at the, most of the barracks at the, at, the, at the castle and some of the surrounding garrisons. And for some of the more well-to-do residents at the back end of Dover towards River. Life was good. She kept the house and it was a quite a nice large house. And all was well until one strange evening, an unexpected visitor arrived. She didn't see who it was. Charles opened the door and let him in. She does know it's a him because they both then instant quickly disappeared into his study and had a very long conversation for the whole evening without any disturbance. Any attempt to open the door was greeted by angry words from Charles. Margaret overheard a number of conversations. They were arguing, sometimes agreeing, sometimes laughing, but it was heated. She couldn't make out this other voice. It found, sounded familiar, but she couldn't pinpoint the, the voice. Eventually, she grew tired and went to bed. Following morning at breakfast, Charles wouldn't disguise, say much and his mood had changed strangely. In fact, for the next hmm, maybe couple of weeks, Charles behaved very strange, totally out of character. He would spend a lot of time in his laboratory in the basement. Working. Now, normally he would ask Margaret to help with any lab experiments, you know, holding test tubes and various things. But no, none of that. And he kept the door locked all the time when he was in there and when he wasn't. This was quite out of character for Charles and Margaret was becoming a little bit concerned. But she left it. He knew best. Obviously something was on his mind. One morning when he didn't turn up for his breakfast, because they normally ate their breakfast together first thing, especially if he had a very busy day, especially, you know, like if he had um, appointments or consultancies out of town or up at the castle. So it was a good chance for them to meet and at least see each other once that day. But he didn't show up for breakfast. She checked his room. It was empty. She checked the door for the lab. It was locked. And with her ear against the door, she couldn't hear anything down there. She thought uh, perhaps he had gone out for an emergency during the night or if he was already out and still needed to come home. She let it go. Come supper time, still no sign. And she slept on it. Following morning, still no sign. Servants hadn't seen him. She began to be concerned. This was very, very out of character, even though the past couple of weeks had been a bit strange. She thought something bad has happened. She could feel something bad had happened. She sent message to the local justice, a friend of theirs, well, a friend of her husband's, really. They were in the army together. The justice sent out word that Charles was missing and various search parties were organized. No sign of him for days. Margaret was beginning a little bit agitated. Now, 
Margaret then happened to mention this change of character to the justice just in passing because, well, he asked about, has there been anyone unusual? And, you know, this visitor and what happened happened after. The justice suggested perhaps they investigate the basement. And for Margaret's sensibilities and she should perhaps stay withdrawn in one of the into the study while the justice and some of the soldiers from the garrison investigate just to be safe well she heard them break the door down they weren't down there very long there was then a lot of running steps up the justice came in to the room and margaret feared the worst. His look on his face was ashen, as if he'd seen something horrific. He grabbed a drink and with a shaky hand, snocked it back very quickly. He looked at Margaret. Be content, Margaret, that while we found something, in the basement, it wasn't your husband. That in itself brought good and bad, bad questions. At least her husband was possibly still alive. But what did they find? The justice wouldn't elaborate too deeply, just for the fragility of Margaret. Her sanity was becoming a little bit stressed but suffice to say a number of bodies were found there in various states of dismemberment and one particular he actually recognized for it was an ex-convict that he had sent to prison who had escaped he recognized some of the, the tattoos and it wasn't a complete body one of the arms had been removed and there were other various miscellaneous body parts this had become slightly more than just a missing persons now. Perhaps Charles was involved in body snatching. The St. James's Cemetery is only just around the corner from the house. And there has been some strange things going on of late. So justice suggested while the house is the state it's in. Perhaps Margaret should stay with the justice and his wife at his lodge, not far from here. Should they have a spare room that Margaret can have? And hopefully Margaret then will feel a little bit more comfortable away from this nightmare. And the two women can spend some time together and happily reassure Margaret that things will be okay once we get to the bottom of this. Margaret just numbly nods and agrees to this. Well, the justice sends out word that there could well be a, a Charles is now a wanted man for body snatching, possible murder and other awful deeds. Margaret's not aware completely everything that then happens. She is aware only through overhearing the justice and his wife talking when they thought she was asleep. That the, bod the remains that were found in the basement were cleared out and buried in St. James's Cemetery and in unmarked graves. For some of these bodies, they could not identify them. So that was the best they could do. But Charles was definitely a wanted man and no one knew who this other person was. And then various reports of some strange, strange and terrifying events unfold. First, about three or four days after the burial in St. James's Cemetery. 
the grave that contained the body of the one armed um, convict had been disturbed and the grave was now empty. That began panic within the community. And a great, and that did not help Margaret in the slightest. Was Charles still in the area? The justice was eager to get his man. A few nights later, a series of grisly murders took place in the pier district, the other side of town towards the harbour, into the docks. A sailor and a woman selling matchsticks were brutally killed in what seemed a crazy friended attack. There was a witness though, and this made things very chilling to all those that heard. As the victim ran off, the, the perpetrator ran off into the darkness. The only feature that people could remember the witness spotted was that the perpetrator only had one arm. Surely not. Surely it cannot be a dead man walking. Well, Margaret had, was taken to bed for quite some time with fever. She was distraught. Was her husband alive? What had he done? One night, while tossing and turning in bed, trying to get these strange ideas out of her head, she knows the tapping on the window. She sits up and sees a figure at the window. Is that Charles? Perhaps he's come to tell her something and needs to do so in secret. Getting out of bed, she moves slowly towards the dark window and then screams at the sight of what's before her. There's a one-armed man shrouded in darkness, very clearly one-armed. She screams and faints. On waking the next morning in bed with the justice and his wife around them, they break some bad news to her. Charles's body has been found. He was beaten badly and crushed even, but found in a packing box in the Pier District. So he is dead and her reputation tarnished beyond doubt. They recommend Margaret leave the country just for a while, perhaps, just until all this bad stuff goes away. Well, as Margaret prepares to leave, some days go by. <coughs> and news rapidly appears, approaches to the justice. The one-armed figure has been spotted. A baying mob is hounding it towards the cliffs. <coughs> the justice is too late to intervene, but the baying mob corners this creature on the edge of the cliff. It willingly leaps over the edge into the darkness and to the sea below. No one could survive that water and that fall. No one got close enough to know whether it was a living creature or not. And no body was found the next day. 
the tide had taken whatever body out to sea. Broken, Margaret makes her journey, <coughs> which is where she meets Mary. So Mary finishes this article, this diary entry relating this story. But there's one later additional note. It's some hours later. <coughs> and she writes additional. We hear news of landing at Calais, but thankfully at last after such a nightmare journey. Our nerves are shot. We disembark. My husband calls to me. My husband to be, that is, calls to me. And I gather my things to leave and join him. Margaret's cousin also appears, but with the howling wind, he has to shout. And when he does and calls for Margaret, I will never forget the look on her face. She is terrified. She looks at me and whispers, that was the voice arguing with my husband. And this odorous cousin of hers, a foul appearance, appears at the door and takes Margaret away. I fear for Margaret. Ah, oh, thank you. What happened to the husband? Is he dead? He's dead, yes. Okay. This is a made up story, right? This is not real. <laughs> I mean, this is not really from Shelley's diary. No, no, it's not. All right, that makes sense. <laughs> but it's using a bit of history because they did come through here. Um, okay. Uh, and there's a uh, up, we've also got the cliff here as well, I go up to it quite often, called Shakespeare Cliff. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a very high, sharp peak, and it gets mentioned in King Lear by mm -hmm. Shakespeare. And it is hor horrific. It goes up to a really tight point, mm -hmm. and it's very narrow, and then it's just a sheer drop. And um, Lord Byron, when he visited a few times mm -hmm. to catch the ship across, he would walk up there quite frequently and come back quite changed, probably because it was a very scary place, especially with the wind. You don't want to be up there too much. It just collapses Thanks. quite quick. So um, sort of combining a few of our little local myths. And, yeah. <laughs> Are you really a journalist or...? just a writer well I'm, i am i do write um i've got about five books published and stuff mostly folk tales and that okay, okay. um but these are i use i know i primarily get involved with ancient egyptian storytelling that's my pure when my real life happen? i love ancient egyptian history right. so um i tend to focused on that but these inky mystery files gives me a little bit more sort of leeway to do stranger and more fanciful stuff so like you know I've got a mixture of horror and history um like an x-files that's set in the past yeah, the x-files nice. scooby-doo yeah. kind of some can be a bit more serious, like that one was a bit more exactly. serious. And then some can be like my alien invasion one on Friday. That's that's there's another one on Friday. And how would I know? Um, I mean, how where do I sign up for that? Oh, right. Okay. Um, well, Arlie, when I email this up, 
Right. Um, you can just send a link to yeah. the event. Well, it's my event, right? Where you, mm. yeah. So I there, think I did see it. Yeah, there should be a link at the bottom somewhere saying oh, um, that makes sense. Or my other stuff, but I'll, I'll throw yeah. in the link. Fair enough. I'll throw if in I the follow link. that, then I can just get yeah. the notes. And also, the YouTube link will have for this recording will give all my other stuff that I've done. So there's yeah, plenty I just of that, so that loads means. of stuff, hours and hours of entertainment. That'd be amazing. I love it. And I think there is a learning moment here as well. Um, I mean, I have never actually had stories read out to me. Okay. Um, I did not realize that at fringe festivals they had writers read out stories. I thought it was just music and plays and things like that. This well, is new. I had no idea. Well, this is this is unusual because there's not really that many many storytellers okay. at the right. Edinburgh Fringe. There's a lot of comedy storytelling, but mm. that's different. And there's a lot of well, there's the whole, I'm under the the um, um, umbrella of spoken word okay fair enough that makes sense. right so and did you memorize your story or are you reading from a script no, I mem- well i've got my notes in case i need it but i'm doing this all from memory, from memory. and obviously also making some of it up as i go along because i can't okay, remember okay, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> i thought you probably had a teleprompter or something i don't know <laughs> no no i tried but it's just too distracting yeah I mean, fair enough fair i enough. just the no tapestry one. behind you, is that uh, just the Zoom background or is no. it? Uh, oh, it's a tapestry, right? Yeah. I thought at first I thought that those were actual books. I thought maybe you were in an archive or something. But uh, then I realized it's a cloth. Right, that makes yes. sense. Yeah, it, it's it's better than having the 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 the, the virtual background. Yeah, you have to go in enough. and out and it's, yeah. it's weird. But then you could be in Hawaii. I could be in Hawaii. Yeah. Not quite. Well, for my fantasy one that I'm doing um, a week on Saturday, I'm going to have a forest one up. Oh, wow. You have other tapestries? Oh, for yes. Separate... Yeah, I've got... How many do you have? Uh, about several. There's a few oh, Egyptian wow. ones. I've got two book ones like this. Then I've got a forest so one nice. <laughs> for my fantasy. It just makes it a little bit more interesting yeah. than just solid it does. black. It's nice. Yeah, I liked it. Okay, I'll I'll try to sign up for a few more so that I can hear you speak again. Brilliant. Okay, I well I have Rue. I have well we may have time for two very short ones. If all right, let's go. Okay. Right. Jill was excited for her first babysitting job. No, 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 no. I'm going to rewind that. It's not her first babysitting job. She'd done a few more. But it's the first time with this family. And they were pushing the boat out somewhat. It seemed to be a really special one, this. Normally, it's just some annoying kid. And she gets an awful lot of grief all the time. Not this time. They were well organized. They had given her some money and a menu for the local pizza place and said, she's welcome to have that. She's also welcome to try anything in the fridge. She can use their satellite, anything she wants to drink. Uh, She felt absolutely, this is perfect, perfect gig. I hope this goes well but it all comes down to the child. Their little daughter, Kate, was absolutely perfect. So unlike every other kid she usually gets. Normally, they are annoying, argumentative, but no, not Kate. Kate was sweet. They'd watched a few cartoons together before bedtime. And there was no argument putting to Kate to bed. And the moment she was in the bed, she started to drift off. It was going to be a brilliant, 
makes a huge change to the usual. So leaving Kate upstairs, Jill plonks down on the sofa, one hand the menu, the other hand the remote. While flicking through to find a film to watch for the rest of the evening, she flicks through the menu and sees what kind of pizza she wants. Absorbed into what she's doing, there's a sudden thump upstairs that catches her attention. Running footsteps. Okay, not sure that's Kate out of bed then. Puts things down. She doesn't want to disturb Kate. And creeps upstairs and has a peek over the landing and sees Kate curled up in her bed. Okay, must have gone to the toilet. No problem. For one moment there, I thought this was going to be annoying, kid, really. Jill returns back to the sofa. Yep, she picks her pizza, found a nice rom-com on the TV, switches that on and places the order for the pizza. Great. Time to get a drink. Not a moment as she opened the fridge to see what's in there that she hears a scream upstairs in the bedroom. Fearing the worst, she sluts the fridge and bolts upstairs to see Kate sat upright, sobbing in her bed. Oh, what's the matter, Kate? Kate, what's the matter? Kate rubs the snotty nose and tears from her eyes and picks up a clown doll next to her and throws it to the foot of the bed. I don't want Billy in the bed with me. He's been a naughty boy this week. I don't want him in here. Okay, thinks Jill. I don't remember seeing him. Perhaps when Kate must have got that when she went to the toilet. Okay, Kate. She picks up the doll and puts it on the bedside table as she leaves the room. Right, back to fixing a drink. Drink set, waiting for the pizza now. Okay. A scream again. Ah, oh, this is turning out to actually not be a good thing. Screaming kids. Argumentative ones I can handle, but screaming ones, no. And this one's playing mind games with me now. Puts her drink down and trans, not so quickly this time, up to the bedroom to find Kate pointing at the bottom of her bed because Billy's there again. Oh, what's this kid doing? Right. She takes Billy and says, Kate, I will take him downstairs with me. Then he can't bother you, can he? No, no, she, she shakes her head and then curls back up to bed slightly. Still not so sobbing, but it's a bit more of a whimper now. Returning down to the stairs, Jill throws the billy clown onto the chair and goes to get her drink that she left by the fridge. She comes back to sit down and then notices the doll has gone. Wow, Kate's quick, isn't she? Quick nose around the room. No, it's no sign of Kate or the doll. Didn't hear footsteps. Puts her drink down and goes up to the bedroom to find Billy on the end of the bed, but Kate is asleep. Mm, nice try. I'm going to pretend. Is she pretending she's asleep? I'm not going to fall for this. Right. I'm taking that doll and it's staying with me this time. So she snatches the Billy doll and takes it back downstairs. This time she doesn't let it out of her sight as she goes and gets her glass again. She sits down. 
the doll is on the chair to her left. So she's got it in sight. That's not good. Kate is not going to catch me out again. The doorbell goes. Jill swears and jumps. Didn't realise that was starting to get to me now. Goes to the door. Pizza guy. Thank you. Pays for the pizza with the money her pet, the Kate's parents kindly left for her. And returns. She almost drops the pizza when she sees Billy has gone. Actually, he hasn't gone. He's moved. He's moved to where she was sitting. There was no way could Kate come in and out that fast. Something odds here. While she begins to open her pizza, because she is just wanting food now, the phone goes. Ah. Uh, what now? It's not her house. Should she answer the phone? Oh, perhaps she should. Well, let's just have a look. Ah, call a display. Oh, it says mother. OK, so it must be her parents phoning up just to check in then. I better answer it then. So Jill picks up the phone and it's Kate's parents on the other end saying how, how if everything's OK. And yep, yep, Jill explains, yep, Kate went to bed lovely. She's been a bit disturbed through the night and with one of her toys, Billy's just annoying her for some reason. But it's under control now. The phone line's quiet. The mother's voice shakily. Billy? What's wrong with Billy? Oh, it, Kate was saying they had an argument and she doesn't want him anywhere near her at the moment. But they seem to be messing around. So, you know, I, I've got it here with me now. And Jill turns to have a look to where she left Billy. But Billy has gone again. Jill catches herself from swearing down the phone to the girl's mother just in time. The mother takes a deep breath. Jill, listen to me. I need to tell you something. Billy is a very, very bad boy. What I want you to do, and if he's been naughty again, I want you, without questioning, just to go up to bedroom, get Kate and get out of the house very quickly. Do not lose sight of Billy. We will be home immediately. We don't want to have any accidents again. Jill freezes. What the? Can you repeat that again? We're coming home now. Get out of the house. And the phone line goes dead. Jill has no idea what to think about that. This is a new one. The kids are usually pranking, but the parents as well. As Jill puts down the phone, her eyes goes into the kitchen. There's the wall all around the kitchen door is smeared with bits of pizza and the box lies half on the floor. What the hell happened there while she was on the phone? She heard nothing. But then she realises what that pizza is smeared as in big words. Let's play hide and seek. You hide and I will find you. Signed, Billy. <laughs> Sleep well after that one? I don't like clowns. Yeah, that was a bit much. 
<laughs> it had everything. <laughs> Alone babysitting, clowns, evil dolls. Yeah. Everything. <laughs> yeah, it hits all my... I, I just don't like yeah. clowns. <laughs> There's something about them. Well, I think it's probably because yeah. I watched the film It when I was... Oh, very... God, I haven't had the courage to watch it. It just looks awful. No, also, no. It kills children. That's just not good. No, it's it's I. <laughs> back in the eighties, there was a lot of video nasties. It was it was the thing, and I think I must have saw the original when I was quite little. So yeah, I think I saw the first one with the what's his name, the guy. Oh, Rocky Tim Curry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that one. It was very. He is a very scary dude. He has been on TV shows as murders and stuff. It's oh, just yeah. very very creepy. He's... He's incredible, Tim Curry. I think he's just yeah. amazing. Oh my god! <laughs> but yeah, so that was uh, that. That was something. Righty ho. Um, I'm not sure. No, I don't think I'll bother with this last one. It's really quite awful. Um, but anyway, um, thank you, and right. sure. I hope you enjoyed those. I really did. Oh, I that's... really did, and I will try to join again. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. All right. right. So, Good night. Uh, hang on a second. Oh no, go I, ahead. Right. Sorry. This I'm gonna re. I'm gonna put the video up. Are you mm. okay with me just leaving your voice in? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, no fine. problem. Then I don't have to edit it. <laughs> yeah. No, it's fine. It's fine. Brilliant. But thank you very much. Yeah. For coming thank along. You. All and right. hopefully I'll see you again. Yeah. Me too. Good night. Well. <laughs> I mean, it's almost night time for it's you not, as well. Yeah, and for me too. Yeah. Night night. All right. Good night. Thank you. Bye bye.